end in July. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first live event organized in the context of our two courses, Integrated STEM Teaching for Primary and Secondary Schools. My name is Eleni Mirciotti, and I would like to thank you for being here on behalf of the team behind the STEMIT project. Today, we are here with my colleagues Evita Tesiopoulou and Jelena Milenkovic in order to discuss the topic of STEM careers and how STEM careers and mentorship are contextualized at school. We have with us Dr. Stacey Habraham Mawson, an astrophysicist and lecturer at the Liverpool John Moores University in the UK, and Erica Borgan, assistant editor of Futurium Careers, a science communications agency in the UK, and a former English teacher. Stacey, Erica, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I'll just uh, share my slides, um, and hopefully everyone can see that okay. So. Um, Thanks very much for uh, kind of letting us um, come along and speak to you all today. We're going to give you a bit of an insight into sort of our own perspectives on careers and how we've used the um, how we've used our own experiences to try and speak to the next generation of students about careers that they might be thinking of and the best ways to actually go about um, engaging students with the discussions about the careers. Um, so just a little bit to introduce you, I'm Stacey Habergan Mawson. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about what I do later on, but um, I'm a project manager and lecturer now um, at Liverpool John Moores University, working on a project called the National Schools Observatory. And I'm joined by Erica, who's going to um, talk towards the end of this presentation about the work that um, she does with Future and Careers magazine. Um, so who I am? As I said, I'm from Liverpool John Moores University in the UK and I manage a project called the National Schools Observatory. It's all based around this image you can see here, which is um, our telescope. It's called the Liverpool Telescope, but it's on the island of La Palma in the Canaries. And it's our tool really that we can engage students um, with space um, through using um, a machine like this, which is traditionally just the realm of kind of a professional astronomer. I'm going to go a lot more into detail later on, but um, what I'm going to do first is just talk a little bit about how I came to be where I am now. So when I was at school, I didn't know there was such a thing as an astrophysicist as a job um, and doing science communication. Um, I certainly didn't think that if that career existed, it would have been something for me. My um, background is not necessarily your traditional route into university or into a physics degree. Um, and throughout my degree, I became more and more interested in sort of communicating what I was doing, especially to young people um, to try and make it clear to young people from not necessarily traditional backgrounds going into education, higher education, that these these jobs existed, these these cultures existed that they could be a part of. So science communication is really what I do a lot of now. Um, and it really stems from me wanting to give more young people the same opportunities that I had um, when uh, I decided to kind of get into this field. So my background um, is I'm from a kind of working class industrial village in the north of England. Um, so the picture in the, the top left there is the, the village that I'm from. It's you can see the chimney from the old mill there. It's a big tech. It, well, it used to have um, a textile background. My parents both worked in the textile industry. Um, and the top right picture was the, the school that I went to. Um, it's only real claim to fame was that it was the highest school in the UK, um, as in above sea level. Um, it was a failing school. It still is, um, unfortunately, um, but it was the only school that really um, anyone from the area could go to. And I was quite good at school when I was younger, and that kind of led me to learn about the fact that, you know, you could go to university. None of my family had ever been to university before. Um, and when I was young, actually, that is all I had in mind. That was my only career goal was I want to get to university. I never thought about what that meant. Um, I never thought about what I wanted to study there. I just knew that I wanted to go. And as I went into secondary school and started learning more and more, um, I got to the point where I was having to 
choose what subjects to study and for my A levels which is what in the UK we study before we go on to university I chose subjects that I liked at the time I um, I chose history I loved history I chose maths which uh, the start of my studies I really enjoyed um, I chose biology and I chose physics and I didn't choose physics because I was particularly passionate about it I chose physics because um, there was we had to choose for, choose from a, a small pool of subjects um, none of them really captivated me and I ended up choosing physics because I knew the teacher because we'd done um, some walking expeditions together they'd led these walking expeditions when I was younger in the school and I thought he was a nice teacher no one was speaking to him on options evening when people were going to choose the subject so I went and spoke to him and I thought why not I'll, I'll pop physics down um, and actually the more I did physics at A level the more that um, I enjoyed it and that was really because I made the connection that um, studying physics involved studying things in space as well and I'd always liked the idea of space since I was very young. Um, during my studies though I found it increasingly hard um, to keep all subjects going. I started to fall out of love with maths. Um, I was working a job at the same time um, as I was studying and just found it a bit too much to handle. Um, I ended up actually dropping maths uh, and because I just I wasn't enjoying it I wasn't enjoying the teaching style um, and yeah I was struggling to keep everything going um, what the pro one of the problems with that was actually by this point I'd already applied to go to university and had to choose what to study um, learned just from scanning the courses that you could do there was this course called astrophysics so astrophysics was specifically looking at space the physics of space um, and that was the part of physics that really interested me and I'd applied to do astrophysics um, I actually also applied to do archaeology because I was still really passionate about history um, and loved the idea of studying archaeology but I thought I'd get a better job at the end of it if I got a physics degree um, so I'd put that as my first choice and then having dropped maths I then had to go around ringing all of the universities that I'd applied for and saying you know I'm sorry I'm dropping I've dropped maths will you still let me come um, because in the UK as in much of the world the prerequisites for studying physics or astrophysics at university are always physics and maths um, qualifications um, and actually the only university that said yes that will still let you come um, was the University of Liverpool um, and that's because they had this additional maths course in the, the first year um, which you could do to kind of catch up to the same level as everybody else so that's where I went that's what I ended up doing I went to Liverpool University um, to do astrophysics um, and while I was there just became more and more in love with the subject um, and ended up working on the telescope that you see there um, as my day job which just it, yeah it's insane to me looking back that that job even existed that there was even a route to get to the job that I'm in now and it was definitely nothing that I could have predicted when I was 17 18 years old um, I can sort of pinpoint why I love the subject and how um, the inspiration that I got to stay in the subject to literally two different astronomical objects um, one of them which is the, the central image and the one to the left is called a supernova 1987a um, it was a supernova explosion in a nearby galaxy called the large magellanic cloud as the name suggests it went off in 1987 so i was just born um, and it was the first object that i actually did a little project on my first year of university and i I took this object because I just looked at it and I wanted to understand what it was, how it looked as it did. Um, it, because you look at this and you think it can't be real, it can't be a real object. Um, it just looks so strange. So I, I got really interested in um, just the objects that you could see in space um, initially through looking at this um, in my first year project. And then in my second year, we had the opportunity to do a, a field trip to Tenerife and we went to the telescopes on top of the mountain 
And I looked through a telescope for the very first time. I'd never looked through a telescope before. And the object that I looked at um, was called the Ring Nebula, which is the image on the right here. Um, and honestly, that week, that single week of my entire four year degree um, was the inspiration I needed to carry on learning in astrophysics because um, that whole process of manoeuvring a telescope, looking through the telescope and then seeing an object like this on the other side of it just completely inspired me. The first time I looked, I thought someone literally just stuck an image on the other side of the machine I was looking through. I couldn't comprehend what I was really looking at and how far away this object was. Um, and it was the beauty of these things that really drew me in as well, trying to understand why they looked the way they did um, and how they could have possibly been created. And I think that's one of the things I want to get across in the session today when we're thinking about careers. Sometimes it is easy to think about careers in terms of job titles. But if you had just spoken to me at school and said you can be a project manager and an astrophysicist, I would not have known what that involved as a career. The job titles don't always tell us what is there. But if you'd have asked me what my interests were and what I was inspired by, um, I'd have been able to tell you I was interested in space. I was inspired by the using the telescope. Um, I was inspired by communicating the things that I was seeing and actually thinking about careers in terms of students' interests and skill sets, I think can be quite a powerful tool rather than us just thinking traditionally in terms of, you know, what job titles are there. And if I do physics at university, I'll either become a lecturer or I'll become a teacher. And often they're the only things that we can we can sort of um, directly link as children um, to careers that involve that subject. And so the work that I'm doing now, we've had a look at um, introducing a new careers section to the the project that I'll talk about a bit more detail soon and that's how we've we've grouped our careers it's not in terms of what these job titles are um but in terms of what interests the student might have um and how they relate to careers specifically for our project it's based around things to do with space so there are things that you might think traditionally you would associate with doing astrophysics or anything to do with space, more and more thinking about the use of computers, um, thinking about space travel, um, astronauts, that's something that we always connect with astrophysics or astronomy, stargazing, you might connect numbers, doing a lot of maths, but there are other things that are actually um, less connected that you can have a, a career in. Um, for example, explaining. So science communication, teaching, um, media work um, and a lot of students are interested in actually explaining the things that they do and they're interested in that communication side of things. There's also things like um, history. So we've got some people who actually do work on history of astronomy or different cultural links to astronomy and um, influencing people, maybe thinking about political aspects um, of jobs that are related to space and astronomy. Um, this this is a kind of a series of different interests that we've put together. You might be able to think of more um, that connect with the theme of space and astronomy. Um, but within these, there are a whole bunch of different case studies, um, different. I mean, if you think about the project management side of things that I do now, that could come into a whole host of these different areas. Um, you know, and explaining can be, you know, literally doing engagement in a classroom. It could be on TV, it could be writing um, stories or in my case, I started doing a lot of work with schools, but I've actually ended up now uh, where I'm managing a project where other people do a lot of the delivery. But um, but I try and, you know, strategize and long term plan and figure out what our goals are. So we've developed this sort of careers area, which is about trying to explore the students interests in different areas and then showing them jobs that that relate to those interests. So I've just got a few case studies here. So this is Jerita Holbrook, her background, sorry, their background is in um, astrophysics, but now they work in um, history and cultural studies of astronomy. So they specifically um, look at different um, African cultures and how astronomy relates to them. They look at um, how the US Navy actually still uses um, stars for navigation. Um, they've looked at different uh, astronomical space culture within um, the Philippines and all sorts of different areas. So it, it's not a job that you would know existed, um, 
but Jarita is doing that job, looking at the different cultural aspects that relate to astronomy. Um, this is Adriana. Her background is in geophysics um, and actually geography before that, rather than ph straight physics, but now works in planetary science, looking at meteorite craters um, and kind of exploring nature, the nature of kind of astrophysics. So where could life exist? What do meteorite impacts on the Earth tell us about the, the history of the Earth? Um, she's specifically done work, for example, on the Chicks Club crater, um, which is from the, the meteorite that struck within the time of the dinosaurs. So it, it's more looking at kind of the natural history of the Earth, but through a lens of um, astronomy in space. Um, another example is Kevin, who has a degree in physics, but now actually works in what we would say like the influencing area. His area of expertise is looking at astronomy for the development. So he works in South Africa for the International Astronomical Union, heading their office there and, you know, has a sphere of influence, looks at how astronomy can be integrated into um, different countries to help um, aid the development of those countries. So, for example, in South Africa, with the development of new telescopes, um, like the square kilometre array, different telescopes that are being produced there. So there's a range of different um, careers that actually it, it's much more deep and diverse than what you would see if you were just looking at people's job titles. I want to be an astrophysicist. Well, what does that mean? Um, and this is often something that I find with our undergraduate students coming to university is that half of them come and they say, I want to be a lecturer in astrophysics, but they don't necessarily know what that means. What is it as a day to day job? Um, so it's actually trying to get to the bottom of, OK, but what are your skills and what are your interests and how can that guide you into a career? Um, this is just an example of a few of the people we've got. We have 50 people so far that we've highlighted on the website and that's going to expand over the next year. Um, and what we've been very mindful of when we've been putting together these little career case studies is looking at the diversity of not just jobs, not just different careers, but the diversity of people as well. Um, I'm not saying we've done it perfectly. We've definitely got to, for instance, expand our um, our case studies in the southern hemisphere. Um, but we've we've provided a 50 50 male split. We've actually got slightly more people of colour than white people. Um, most of these are um, living case studies, though there are some more historical ones, but we're trying to make this people who are as much as possible have been working in the area kind of within the last 10, 15, 20 years so they can get an idea of what kind of modern careers are available in these areas. And it's trying to show that diversity that I think is very important as well, because when we're looking to guide students into possible career choices, it, it's, it's easier for a student to see themselves in a career if they can connect with someone who's already doing that. So, um, I mean, we were briefly chatting before we came on live about did I have any kind of role models in this area growing up? And I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't have any career role models. I was very encouraged by my parents to study for as long as possible because they knew that education was a path that would get me into a good job. Um, but actually when I was started doing well at school, they just told me to do medicine because that was all they knew. You know, if you're doing well at school, you go do medicine. And that was the job that they kind of associated. I had no idea. I didn't know anybody in physics, astrophysics. I got on fairly well with my teachers, um, but I, I couldn't aspire to a career in this. I sort of just slid into it the further that I spent studying this subject. Um, but I think now more and more it's important to try and show students that there are people like you doing this now. So I like to communicate the work I do and going to schools, for example, where there isn't a, a, an, a long history of people going to university. So, OK, but my background was the same. Still no one from else from my family has been to university. I'm still the only person that's been. And hopefully that will change with, you know, with the next generation, with my son and my nephew. But it was an unusual thing to happen. It wasn't the normal thing. But if you can show people, show students now that there are people from those backgrounds that haven't, you know, who were the first generation to go to university or don't have white skin or, um, you know, a female but working in um, engineering or IT or some of the careers that are even more heavily dominated um, by men than than physics is. Um, 
if you can show them examples of people, then the idea is hopefully the more diverse a range of people that you can showcase, the more um, the, the greater the chances that your students can find somebody that they really connect to, find somebody that they share something in common with. And I think that's one of the biggest hurdles when you're trying to, you know, expand their knowledge of what what is available for them. Um, so that's really what we've tried to do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we've tried to do that in terms of a, just an example of an activity as well um, in a, a short while. But I want to just introduce you a little bit more to this project that I've been talking about, um, this National Schools Observatory that I, I manage now. And the whole kind of thing that motivates us is trying to provide access to the universe for all. So when I said that I got my first opportunity to look through a telescope when I was in my second year of university, um, why can't we provide students with that opportunity when they're much younger to potentially have that same kind of inspirational moment? Um, and that's not possible by going everyone, to everyone's back garden and taking a telescope around. But because we have this piece of machinery, um, it allows us to provide access to anyone around the world to get that opportunity to have a look through a telescope. Um, and that's because um, the Liverpool telescope is the world's largest fully robotic telescope. So what that means is it can be accessed remotely. It doesn't have an astronomer sat there all night. It takes observations for itself um, and 10 percent of the time on that telescope is dedicated for schools. And that's through this National Schools Observatory project. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little video of the telescope in action. As I said, it's not a traditional telescope. It doesn't have an astronomer sitting at the bottom of it. It checks the weather every night. If the weather's good, it opens the enclosure and it starts taking observations and 90% of the time is for astronomers, professional astronomers around the world to use, but the school's observation requests get ranked exactly the same priority as all those science observations. So the telescope itself decides what the best thing to observe is at any point during the night and starts observing away. Um, and then the next morning sends all of the data back to our headquarters in Liverpool and then we distribute it to the schools. Um, and I just think it's it's amazing that since this telescope was built, the, the school's aspect of it has been embedded into it. And as I said, they can have exactly the same priority as any science user around the world. So it's not like, oh, when we've got spare time, we'll do something for schools. It's that they have exactly the same um, status as anyone else using the telescope. Um, because of the way we're funded, schools in the UK and Ireland do have enhanced access to the telescope. That just means that they can take a bigger range of observations to get more choices in what to observe. Um, but anyone from around the world can access this telescope. They can register as a user on the telescope and access is completely free. Um, and our whole ethos behind what we're doing is around letting the students actually do science so not just um telling them something teaching them something involving them in being a scientist so it's it's this whole premise tell me and i forget teach me and i remember involve me and i learn um so we don't for instance provide students just with a picture from the telescope we provide them with a data file and that data file they can do science with um so it's really about having letting them have that experience of asking for an observation seeing that observation of something in space come back that then they can they can manipulate and analyze and do science with and that our whole premise about doing this is not to just churn out a batch of astrophysicists who will be doing this job in 10 15 years time there aren't enough jobs in the world for astrophysicists just to do that um but we want to use the fact that students generally have an interest in space to engage them with STEM subjects more broadly. So thinking about the technology that we have on the back of the telescope to take these observations, to analyze, analyze these observations, thinking about the engineering that goes into actually the design, the build of a telescope, especially a telescope like this, which is completely autonomous. Um, thinking about the technicians and the side of maintaining telescopes like this, software engineers, all sorts of different careers. Um, looking at different objects in space can tell you about the chemistry of those objects. So it's really about trying to be much more broad, not just trying to 
produce a whole batch of astrophysicists, but trying to use this passion for space to get students thinking about STEM more broadly. Um, and we're guided in doing that by what we call a set of generic learning outcomes. I'm not expecting you to read all of these. This is sort of just for just for your reference. This is what we work to day to day. And as you'll see, there's there's a branch that's understanding. So we do try and get that scientific understanding of whatever they're studying. Um, there's also skills because we're very, as I said, we provide data files. So there's a lot of um, using pieces of software to actually analyse these images and pull science out. But just as important, we're guided by trying to change students' behaviour. So are they more likely to look more positively on STEM or participate in other STEM subjects after using our project? Do their feelings change? Do they feel more empowered to ask questions or inspired to find out more? And do they value science in a different way, having participated with the school's observatory? So do they value the role of science in society? Do they have a better understanding of the opportunities that are available for different STEM careers? So we're constantly trying to guide ourselves using this, this set of criteria. And we've actually just had an external evaluation done that says we're doing pretty good. We're, we are doing pretty good on this. So um, this is what we're really trying to do is inspire students across all of STEM, but as I said, using astronomy as sort of the hook, the thing that they're engaged with. Um, so how we try and do that is we we make using the telescope easy. So we have a different, uh, simple user interface to actually take observations with the telescope. So for example, this is our Go Observing section. This is what students or teachers will see when they register. They can do something like click on the moon and then they'll be given a map of the moon. They can click on which area of the moon they'd like to get an observation of and that observation is sent to the telescope and it can be that simple. Um, they can click on planets and say I want to observe Mars. It will tell you when you're most likely to be able to observe it and it will send that observation off to the telescope. Um, it can get more complicated than that. So for instance, they can look at what we call deep sky objects. So these might be nebulae or galaxies and they can create, for example, three colour ob observations of those by taking observations in different filters and combining them in the software. So it can be very, very simple or it can get more difficult as um, the users get more of an understanding about what they're doing. Um, we provide students with the ability to analyse the images again for free. All of this is for free um, because there are different astronomical softwares out there that are free to download. So Salsa J is quite a popular example, but usually they're quite complicated. Even for professional astronomers, you might only ever use five, ten percent of the tools that are on those pieces of software. So instead we created our own piece of software, which is just called LT Image. And the first thing students will do is they'll get their observation back from the telescope and they'll open it up in this software and they'll get an observation like this and they'll think, well, that's a bit rubbish. This is like a four million pounds telescope or something. And there's just a few kind of white dots against a black sky. Well, that's what I see when I go outside. But actually it's introducing to them that the, the camera is a lot more sensitive to light than our eyes are. And therefore they have to do manipulation of this image to actually get some um, science out. So first of all, they can change the scaling on the image so that we're saying, OK, show me the fainter objects that are on that image. And when they do that, suddenly this object pops out from nowhere. And that's because we're looking at much fainter light. Not only can they do that, they can measure things on this observation. So this one in particular, for instance, we can measure the distance across it. So we have a tool that measures size and distance. And as long as we know how far away something is, we can tell you how big an observation, uh, how big an object is in space. So in this case, for instance, we draw um, triangle across the surface plots you know just literally using Pythagoras we can get the hypotenuse and it tells you um, how many pixels that is well obviously pixels is a useless um, scale but we can we also provide them with calibration data so we know that this object for example is 1.2 thousand light years away and because we know how far away it is we can tell them that every single pixel on this observation is 115 astronomical units, which is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So one pixel on this image is 115 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And this object is over a thousand pixels across. So now they're starting to get a sense of scale about the universe as well. And we change the calibration information depending on what they're looking at. So if this, for example, is measuring a crater on the moon, it would give the distance in kilometers rather than 
astronomical units. If this is um, a galaxy and they're trying to measure the distance across the galaxy, it would give the the um, scale in light years. So they're getting an idea of sense of scale and, and um, the magnitude of some of these objects. And then they can also, as I said, combine them to create three colour observations like this one by just taking observations in a, a red, green and blue filter. Um, so we give them the software to use um, so they're actually doing this science and then we do the support along the way as well. So the website has a huge learn section, which has got it, it's basically an encyclopedia of astronomy and space um, written by professional astronomers, but with students in mind. So it's not over complicated, but tries to get all of the facts across. And we have like a discover section, which has a whole range of different activities and things like that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those now. We have a batch of what we call classroom activities, which might be of interest to you. Um, so these are sort of packaged activities that come with um, lesson plans, that come with pres introductory presentations, that come with the data, and you can get the software for free off the website as well. And you can download it all as a package. We have 24 different classroom packages there um, covering ages right from five years old to 18 years old. We cover different science topics. We cover technology, we cover light, gravity, orbits, tides, solar system, all sorts. But then there's also the skills side of that. So there's a lot of computing, numeracy, data processing, problem solving, evaluation, all sorts of different skills that come along with it as well. And wherever the the um, projects ask you to actually analyse observations, there's obviously the computing software as well. On top of those kind of classroom packaged activities, we have quick activities which might be good as a starter or plenary to lessons. We have in-depth research projects which are really good for age probably 16 plus um, where they can actually get involved with current research and we have a whole batch of um, STEM club activities if your school runs a STEM club so these are really looking at the cross-curricular side um, and that's going to be expanding over the next uh, few months as well. I want to just highlight one of those activities which relates back to these career case studies that we talked about at the beginning. So this is where um, this is aimed at primary school students and it's looking at investigating kind of the jobs available to people who enjoy space and science, but it's using quizzes and discussion. And this is really about trying to get students to address stereotyping. Um, and to go through a process of self-discovery. What are my own skills? What are my own interests? And how could that relate to a career within this um, sort of industry? So part of that is we have a space jobs quiz, um, which really starts looking at the, the stereotyping aspect. So we have a range of statements and students will kind of put a true or false answer up. And then the supporting information to do with whatever that statement is. So for example, boys and girls can go to space. Um, and you might then start addressing some stereotypes about what does it take to go to space? Is it around courage? Is it around bravery? Is there any kind of gender stereotypes involved in that? Um, of course, the answer is true. And then we give a link to a particular career profile that, that um, addresses that particular um, topic. So Mae Jameson is, for example, one of our astronauts that's profiled on this website. Are all scientists boys? Obviously, the answer is false. Most of the first computer programmers were girls. That's actually true. And that talks about, for example, Dorothy Vaughan and thinking about the um, the first, uh, literally they were called computers that worked for NASA doing the kind of the mathematics side of things. Girls are better at writing than boys. Well, obviously that's false. And we try and address somebody who, Anthony Avini, who's um, looks at the history of astronomy and is a prolific author in the field. So, we're trying to, with this short activity, try and address some of these stereotypes that might exist um, when we're thinking about careers in this area. And then we do kind of what we call stand up jobs game. So this is then for the students to kind of go through that process of self discovery. So we have a range of different jobs. Engineer and scientists are just examples of them. And there's five statements that are skills that relate to that job. So um, we get all the students to stand up ask them the first question. I like to solve puzzles. If they don't, they can sit down. If they do, they stay standing and then you go through the rest of them. So I also like designing and making things. And if you get to the end, the students that are still standing, you say, OK, well, maybe a career as an engineer would be something that you'd be interested in. So instead of just giving them the job title, it's it's trying to get them to go through thinking about what they like to do and what their skills are and then how that can relate to different careers in this field. So this is just an example of one of the activities we've got. Um, and as I said, there are a whole bunch more on the website if anyone is interested.
I'm shortly going to hand over to Erica, but just sort of um, a closing kind of remark about my side of things. The, the schools observatory is really guided by this principle of doing science and then using astronomy as this hook to engage students in more of STEM. Um, if anyone is interested, the website is huge. It's free. Everything about it is free. Observing um, the lesson plans, everything that's on there. You just have to register. Um, it's got these packaged classroom activities, but on top of that, it's also got a lot of cross curricular activities, especially this STEM club section, that, as I said, will be revamped in the next three months and expanded quite significantly. Um, the my background and the job that I'm doing now was really um, something that I'd not been very introspective about until I came across um, Future and Careers and we started talking about, um, OK, how what was your career path? How did you get in here? And because you don't you don't think that your path is particularly odd until you start talking to other people. Um, but it was quite nice to speak with Futurum and learn about what they do um, and try and uh, show how my path was and how it's not black and white. It's not as black and white as you got to do maths, you got to do physics to get onto this degree, you got to do this degree to do X, Y, Z. People have a lot of different career routes into different jobs in this area and um, this was just um, mine was mine was not usual and therefore it was quite nice to express it in a way through this future article so I'm going to pass over to Erica who's going to tell you a little bit more about what Futurum does and um, and the different uh, ways that they're trying to inspire the next generation with careers in STEM. OK, thank you, Stacey. Um, hi, everyone. Just to let you know, Stacey's going to be doing the clicking for me. So bear with us if our timing isn't perfect, but I'm sure we'll be fine. Um, yes, yeah, so my name's Erica and I'm going to talk about what we do at Future and Careers. What I really hope is that a lot of what I say echoes what Stacey has said. Um, Stacey is an amazingly inspirational character um, and she's, to me, as somebody who doesn't know a single astrophysicist in my everyday life, is somebody who's really accessible, um, a typical everyday person that I can relate to. I don't have a background in science. And so actually that premise of me meeting an astrophysicist and thinking, oh, they are a normal person, is kind of the thinking that we try to do with Futurum. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about what we do and hope you see our resources hopefully will help you to kind of show different personalities, different professionals like Stacey, within your classroom. So firstly, um, just about what Future and Careers is. So we are a free teaching resource. Um, we work with academics such as Stacey to create STEAM teaching resources. We do aim our products at 14 to 19 year olds, um, but obviously there's a little bit of sort of give and take either way, depending on your students. Um, all our resources are free to download. You can see on the right hand side we have um, a magazine that comes out, but actually more relevant for you is our website, but also we post um, resources on scientists, tests, teachers pay teachers, which is sort of more American based, and then also the European Geosciences Union. The key thing for us is that our career guidance hits the Gatsby benchmarks, which may not be highly relevant for you, but it's about getting some real life career experiences for students and that's something that's highly relevant in the UK. So um, what I'm going to talk through now, the kind of premise really about future rooms, I think really echoes what, what Stacey said. We very much believe that if students can see that breadth of opportunity, build the subject knowledge, value what their subject means beyond the classroom and actually learn about real life opportunities, learn about real life people, as long as they're given advice and they start to think about what their interests are, then they can aspire. And I think as teachers, the most important thing we can do in our classrooms is to have those conversations with young people so they can aspire to be something. Um, you know, Stacey's just talked about she didn't necessarily have a huge range of aspiration. Her aspiration was I am going to go to university because that's what she knew about. And actually, it's incredibly lucky that Stacey saw her physicist, the physics teacher at the open evening and went and talked to that person. Um, you wonder how many students are within their classrooms and if they were given that knowledge, 
what they could possibly aspire to. So that's our premise. And so our resources are all sort of based around motivating and building that aspiration. Um, so the next image and the next slide, I just want to give you sort of a little bit of an overview of the kind of topics that our resources touch on um, and the breadth of the opportunity that is out there that I don't think many young people know about. And if I'm honest, I don't know if you know, many teachers know about it. So I'm just going to go through a few here just to give you an outline. We've had, gosh, articles about machine learning, plant science, astronomy, um, humanitarian engineering, marine ecology, uh, biochemistry, aerospace engineering, physics, and mathematics, um, geography and how it's connected to politics, um, engineering, bioengineering. This project is a whole mixture of structural engineering, bioengineering, cyber security, um, you know, a huge, huge range there. But actually, and this touches again on what Stacey said, it's not just about throwing those titles at students. Actually, it's telling students what work these people actually do. So I just picked out a couple here um, because I think these are interesting articles that you could read with students in the classroom, get them to think about, you know, would they like to contribute to projects such as this? And actually, what do these roles mean for our world? Because they are real life applications. So we've got Dr. Bridal there who's working on developing um, sensors to de detect pollutants to um, work against antibacterial resistance. We've got researchers preparing our country for carbon zero future and we've got uh, Dan Flippo on the right there who's working and using his knowledge of agricultural um, biological engineering to create robots to help feed people. Um, I think these applications are really really important because if, if we say to students oh you could be an agricultural engineer I'm not really sure what that involves and I think that's what Stacey was saying but if suddenly we're looking at a proper individual, a real life researcher who is making robots to help people grow things, to help global poverty, suddenly you've got a career that sounds real, that sounds exciting and is really, really aspirational. Um, so our articles often cover sort of different research researchers like that. Um, the next section is um, we do like to place emphasis on them meeting people. So another section of our resources is about meeting people and asking them how they became what they have become. And that's what Stacy was just referring to. And that's really, really important because, um, Stacey, if you just click on a little bit, I think I've got five people on this slide, all really different people from really different walks of life and at really different stages of their careers. Um, you know, we've got somebody still at university studying maths. On the left hand side, we've got Professor Tom Vania, who's sort of coming really to the peak of his career. And yet they're all giving their own insight into what made them become what they're, you know, what they are now. Um, and the kind of conversations that hopefully that could encourage within your classroom um, could be really, really valuable. So conversations such as, you know, what do you think of this person? What similarities do you have with them? Are you surprised about what they've said? Are you surprised about, you know, the career path they've taken? But again, it's given those faces and those real life stories to, to job titles or disciplines in STEM that otherwise could feel really, really inaccessible. OK, so our resources, once we feel we've kind of shown some really interesting research that's going on in the world, hopefully grab students' attention. We've introduced them to um, experts that hopefully they would love to aspire to be. We do then try and give some sort of practical and personal advice because, you know, students need to know what the next steps are. Um, and this is a chance for them for, for teachers in the classroom if they're advise, advising their students be it in their lesson or be it in a tutor time or a careers advice session about what possibly could be the next steps to take. So I've got a couple of different examples of resources here, um, but they're about the different pathways, the different routes they can take. 
And then more importantly, some advice and some questions from the researchers themselves. So on the left hand there, um, agricultural scientist April is asking students about their confidence in their subject, about what motivates them. And on the right hand side, you can see Mike there, who's a biologist, is giving his top tips. Um, again, trying to sort of encourage that that conversation within your classroom or within classrooms or even if students look at this at home it'd be wonderful to think you know conversations with their parents about these people and about the paths that they have taken and, and the advice that they've given okay um so that's those sort of main aspects i've just shown you are from the the main articles in our resources but we always have activity sheets and actually one of the things i want to highlight today is the talking points and mainly because um i think personally as somebody who's an ex-teacher it's those conversations you have in the classroom of your students that might el elicit the most amazing learning and actually unless we ask the questions thoughtfully we're not going to get our students thinking the way that we want so our activity sheets always come with talking points and you'll see that they build from the knowledge comprehension questions to show that they've at least understood some of the basics of the article and they go through Bloom's taxonomy and they come to evaluation questions. Um, that is making sure that if these activities are being used in the classroom or if they're being used at home, students are actually reflecting on them and they're taking time to digest, digest and think about them rather than just seeing it as a reading exercise. Um, I've taken out some of the, the sort of sentence starters of some of the questions we use because I hope you can see what we try to do and I think actually what we should all be doing with any any learning anyway which I'm sure everyone knows is kind of place the onus more on the student so instead of saying this is what so and so has done this is what you could do actually asking students well okay what motivates this person what motivates you do you believe blah 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 you know which do you think is a good solution imagine if you were a biochemist what would you be doing um again just trying to encourage that that sort of really active and involved learning conversation and obviously this is something that could be conversations between peers between students not necessarily between um students and, and teachers um so the next slide I just want to talk a little bit more about the evaluation question we try to get in at the end, which is this idea of sort of forcing them to reflect on their own interests. And I think ties in really nicely to what Stacey was saying about how um, what we do should be about listing their interest rather than just thinking about a label. So on this worksheet that we produced, um, this is Karina, who's the marine ecologist. And the evaluation was asking them, first of all, you know, what they had, what they had learned and what they'd gained from the article, which is obviously really important. But then I like that second question where Karina lists lots of attributes that she believed were really important to be a, sci a successful scientist. But actually, the question now puts it back onto the student and asking them if they think they've got those kind of attributes. And they might say no, or they might say I've got this or I've got that. Um, the next one is David. Um, his questions of evaluation were actually about science and the broader scope of it. Um, his piece referred to uh, a scientist who'd won a peace prize and actually our question is well is that relevant when should a science be connected to peace um, but we think that's a really important question because we think that if you're going to get students thinking about careers you need them to think about how that career can have an impact on society that's really motivational for young people so getting them to see the relevance and the importance of the subject and what it might mean for, for the bigger picture um, and again, the next one is David talking about collaboration. And I think this links sort of well to what Stacey said as well, how, yes, he's a he's a plant scientist, but he's not going to be a very good one unless he's really good at collaborating. So actually, we need to get students to reflect on skills that they might not think are important and they really, really are. And actually, if you have a student in the classroom who thinks, oh, I'm brilliant at collaborating, but I know nothing about plant science, fine they know they're halfway there they've got some skills that actually match skills that the scientists have got they just now need to work on their subject knowledge um so i think the value evaluation is really really important 
Um, the next slide is a little bit more about just some of the activities that we pose that we hope can be used either within a classroom to help your teaching or for homework or to stretch and challenge students in their own time. So I'll just run through them really quickly. On the left hand side, we've got a mathematics challenge that still means absolutely nothing to me, even though I edited that worksheet. But that was set by Sam, um, a mathematician. Um, and we think that's important because we like the idea of the connection between the scientist and the student, challenging them and saying, can you do this? I can't. Um, and then the next two sheets are activities devised by two separate groups of scientists. So they set out these activities. They link very much to the real life research that they're doing. And the aim is to get students think a little bit deeper about what these scientists do and get them involved with doing similar sort of thinking and similar problem solving. Um, so I've, I've gone through briefly our articles, how we want to introduce people, how we like to get them thinking about themselves, how we think it's really important to give stimulating activities. Um, I think this is the last thing I wanted to say, though, which is really, really important. Um, is about keeping the conversation going. Now, I think that's within your classroom. That's with students. This is how we try and do it on, on our website. At the bottom of each of our um, uh, articles, we always have a submit a comment section. And actually, we've just changed that to make it really obvious to people that they can communicate with the scientist. So, for example, at the bottom, it would now say um, this was Alan. The last one would now say, have you got a question for Alan? And what we'll try to do is pass questions on to scientists. Um, here's an activity that was a citizen science based activity where young people on our website were invited to contribute to Alan's actual result, um, actual research. So that's a little bit like Stacey's premise of getting people hands on involved with some actual science. Um, and the next bit um, is actually Alan's response. You don't need to read all of that, but I just wanted to point out there's a section there where he says he got feedback from as far as Australia. Um, which is brilliant because if we think we can do something on our website that could enable you to get students connecting with different scientists around the world, then hopefully we're already targeting that, you know, already tackling that idea of, of, of scientists being inaccessible. Um, and I think the last thing here is actually one of our partner sort of organisations that's on our website. And I just wanted to throw that in because this is about providing students with an opportunity where they can Skype a scientist. Um, and, and I wanted to include that because I think what I'm trying to say from our perspective at Futurum is that if we do want to contextualise careers within the classroom, we need to make them relevant, we need to make them sound exciting um, and we need to give students an opportunity to talk about it and to revisit it and have those learning conversations. And if that learning conversation might even be with a scientist sort of through our website or for another organisation, then absolutely all the better. And then I think we're succeeding, hopefully, in inspiring that next generation of Stacey's, which is what we want to do. Um, and I think yeah, and that's it from me. Bit quick, but I hope that was clear. Erica, Erica stay safe. Thank you so much for your presentations, the points raised, the information shared. Uh, it was amazing. And we have collected some questions for both of you from our participants. Um, based on the career sheets that you both shared, what activities would be appropriate for us to do in the field of astronomy at primary school level? So um, if if anyone wants to have a look, the, our website is schoolsobservatory.org, O-R-G on the end, and we have got a batch that are for primary schools as well. Um, actually, with primary schools, what we try and do a lot more is the cross-curricular linking. So we have literacy activities, for example, looking at the biographies of astronauts. We have numeracy activities that are connected to the Apollo landings. Um, there's a whole bunch of things where um, you can get students actually doing uh, other subjects through through space as the interest area. We've also got ones um, looking at um, the topology of the moon, looking at the different um, uh, lunar features on the surface of the moon, um, and they can plot up different parts um, 
highlight different areas of the moon's surface and start thinking about the geological structures as well. There's a whole batch of different things. It, it's really easy in primary school. I know in the UK, for example, the primary curriculum is very much focused around just our solar system. But if we ever go into schools, the range of questions we get can go literally from the moon to do we have aliens to what happens if you get sucked into a black hole so students interest in this area is much broader than what they're actually taught on the curriculum so the the ability to kind of inspire them um in different subject areas and actually thinking much much more wide scale than just what's our solar system how many planets are in our solar system you know uh, primary schools uh, are just a source of amazing questions and imagination um which seems to certainly uh, certainly from my experience in the UK, the students fear asking questions as they get older, but you don't get that as much in the primaries. So, you know, find out what your students' interests are as well and feed off that. Um, I, I've told you about our website. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of other resources that are out there that are free to access as well. Um, but there's there's so much you can do with primary schools as well. Thank you very much, Stacey. Uh, we have another question. It's, pro it's a statement and then a question. Um, I remember a sentence from Carl Sagan's book Contact and from the respective movie in which the main character Ellie said that as a little girl, she knew that the clouds on Venus were made of sulfuric acid. So Ellie said, at that moment, I said to myself, you're already trapped. Is this what happened to, is it happened to me too? Did something similar happen to you, Stacy? What was the role of your school and your choice? And what was the turning point for you that led you to astrophysics? Um, that's really difficult to answer. I think I had both good and bad experiences with my school. <laughs> Me dropping maths was a result of um, really clashes with um, the teachers in the school and just uh, just not not enjoying it. So that was kind of a negative thing that I think did make it harder for me to carry on in astrophysics. Um, what I did find really beneficial at my school was that I never noticed a gender stereotyping when I was doing my physics. We had a very, very small physics class anyway, and I was the only girl, but when there's only five students, that doesn't mean much. Um, and actually, I found that the teacher was just as encouraging to everybody um, and really gave us the ability to try and think outside of the curriculum and, and explore and discuss questions that weren't necessarily going to be on your exam paper. Um, Honestly, I have no I have no idea why I chose astrophysics apart from that I saw that it was a degree title and I thought I really like space. It's really interesting. And then and, and that's the only driver that I had. And it's when I got to university that I started finding I when I went to university, I've never I would have never classed myself as an astrophysicist, a physicist, a mathematician, any of that. And it was during my university course that I really found myself as that person and I think it's just because the way of learning at university was so much different there was so much more emphasis on yourself to try and do things and that independence that came with it that I found that that just related to me more um I can't pinpoint apart from those those uh, probably that field trip looking through that telescope and seeing those observations is probably what kind of captivated me to stay in and do it thank you very much is there a person that has served as an inspiration for you Um, I am inspired by lots of people I work with, but um, I don't think I would, I wouldn't say that any of those were people that I'd seen before I got into the subject because I wasn't from a background where, for instance, we didn't watch science programs on the TV. We didn't go to science museums. That wasn't something that we did. Um, so I never really came across many people in that field. I always found we had a program in the UK called Time Team, which was archaeology based. And there was a female archaeologist on there called Carenza Lewis. And she was the only person that as a child I saw any relation to, that I had any connection to. And she has nothing to do with astrophysics, but I did find her inspiring. Everyone that I find inspiring through astrophysics now is someone that I've met since I've been doing this as a job um, and the people that I would have never come across because there tend to be people that aren't in the media um, you know um, so I find it hard to say there's this one person that really inspired me um, but yeah thank you very much um, students are very interested in astrophysics at an early age. However, this curiosity and interest decrease due to the lessons, exams, and the pressure and anxiety of finding a job in the future. 
What would you recommend for students in order not to lose this interest? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult that when the exam pressure starts to come on that people, uh, students now at a younger, younger age are being forced to make career decisions that will last the rest of their life. That's the impression that they have when they're 13, 14 years old. What I try and really say to students is, do you know what? It's not that simple. You don't have to decide now what you are going to do for the rest of your life. People change their mind all the time. We have people who work in the field now who actually started doing um, arts degrees, dropped out, ended up doing chemistry and then did an astrophysics PhD and now they work on a telescope. People have come from all sorts of different backgrounds and it's part of it is trying to relay, like relieve that pressure of them to think that they have to have their entire life planned out at such a young age. Um, it, in order to keep the interest going, I think it's trying to hook them on something outside of school because obviously teachers are you're under so much pressure to just teach what's on the curriculum to get your students to get the grades to pass the exams you you're always limited by how much you can let them explore outside of that if you've got the time to let them look at the news see what's going on in the news see what's going see what the new research is and try and keep them questioning things i always think questioning is the best way to encourage anyone to become a scientist because that's all scientists do we ask questions then try and find out the answers and we try and figure out what questions to ask to get to the answer so allowing them to keep questioning is a big thing and then trying to get them to encourage them to use what we try and do with our website is trying to have it as a resource that a student will want to go home and use not necessarily have to use in the classroom and there are several other websites that are out there or resources that are out there that are trying to to have that release that students can keep following their passions even if the passions aren't at that moment reflected in what they're being taught at school it's difficult though Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, it's time to wrap up. I would like to sincerely thank both Erica and Stacey for your contribution and your presentations and all the information shared, as well as Evita and Yelena, my colleagues who are here with, uh, with us tonight. And of course, all our participants for being here and the questions shared. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. <laughs>